All right. Good afternoon, good evening, assalamu alaikum, wherever you may be in the world. Welcome to Gun 7. I'm your host, Ifrahud Gun. I'm really excited for today because we have a wonderful guest with us, a true, true Nagnol Gabdagul. I'm really happy to have Shukri Alo here today. Shukri, welcome. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Ifrah. It's such a pleasure to be joining you and uh, your amazing friends on Facebook Live. I'm really excited to be here. Awesome. I'm really glad to have you. I'm really glad to have this conversation with you as a fellow Somali American, as a fellow Somali woman, um, as a mother. You know, there's just so much that I'd really like to talk to you about. I'm really excited that you're here. For those of you um, or for those of us Shukri, who aren't very familiar with your work, would you please introduce yourself, um, your journey or what you're working on right now? Yeah. Wow, I'm not sure where to begin, but first uh, I want to thank you again, Abai Man. Really appreciate the conversation. Um, I want to give a shout out to Abdul Avan, who made this natural connection just like a couple of days ago on Facebook. He's like, Do you know Ifrah? And I was like, No, but I need to get to know her like ASAP. Um, and then within like three days, maybe uh, this happened. And so um, it's both Abdul and also the universe, I think, just aligning uh, this connection in our favor. And so I'm really humbled. Uh, so, like you mentioned, I am a mother of two young people, an eight-year-old boy and a 10-year-old daughter who sort of like refused to stop aging. Um, <laughs> I keep telling people that like I'm not getting older, they're getting older. And, um, <laughs> and then um, I'm also a doctoral candidate, uh, inshallah, graduating with my doctorate in education, leadership and organizational learning in 2021, um, May of 2021 to be exact, uh, but who's counting? I'm counting. Mm -hmm. um, and then I work for our local government uh, as the strategy lead for this initiative called Best Starts for Kids, um, leading the youth development strategy of the initiative, which invests in 31 organizations that are supporting young people countywide. And finally, I'm also a candidate for um, King County Council District 5, which covers seven uh, cities in King County in the state of Washington. And um, I think that's what we'll be talking about today, in addition to lots of other great topics. Absolutely. Wow. You are a very busy woman, right? So I'm really thankful, you know, that you're here with me today, that you're here with us today, having this conversation. Um, time is very precious, right? So all of us, but especially when you have such little, such little time, let's say the same amount of time, but you have so much to do. So props to you and uh, a personal thank you from me to you for uh, giving us your time today out of your busy day. Um, speaking of time, right, being a mother, you know, being a candidate, being a doctoral candidate, um, working on a campaign, how, girl, how do you do that? Okay, just tell us <laughs> what the secret is so that girl, we can also be great like you. No, that's hilarious. First of all, um, I think everyone is uh, incredibly busy now, now, especially I think post COVID, we are scheduling so many meetings, it seems like we're actually doing more work than, um, you know, our pre COVID days, which feel like a mm -hmm. long time ago. And you're one of them, like you're an incredible inspiration. Ifrah. You're also a mother, a high school teacher, I think you, you teach in um, uh, high school in, in the state of Columbus, right? Or in the state of Ohio in Columbus. Yes, um, yes. And then you also are a writer, a podcaster. Um, <laughs> and like, I don't like, I don't know how you do it. I'm incredibly inspired by you. Uh, Thank in terms you. of your question, though, I think, um, Wallahi, I think we just sort of take it uh, one day at a time, perhaps one uh, minute at a time. Like, mm -hmm. I think our schedules are kind of all over the place. So like this morning, I had a a meeting with my dissertation colleagues uh, for two hours and then I had another meeting at 10 and then we checked in briefly about this conversation and then we're meeting with yes. young people uh, this afternoon to learn more about why it is that they're voting during this election mm -hmm. cycle, this important presidential election. And mm. then I'm going to spend time with the kiddos after picking them up from their dads and so um, you know, all of that happens, I think, with obviously time management, um, but also just taking it one day at a time and breathing throughout um, as we're sort of transitioning from one thing to another. There's no perfect sort of cookie cutter solution. If there was, I think somebody would have patented it and um, have been have become a sort of a millionaire. Right. But that hasn't happened yet. <laughs> 
<laughs> right, right. We would have patented, right? And I would have definitely yeah. wanted to be in, you know, on it as a fellow, you know, Somali sister, like hook a girl up. Yeah. Um, doing all of that, right? So time management is key. Um, how do you take care of yourself? You know, how do you not how do you take care of yourself so you can rise to the occasion as a mother, as a student, you know, as a um employee or a community worker and at working on your campaign as well? How do you take care of yourself? Uh, I think uh, that that's a wonderful question. The question, um, I'd like to reframe it. Am I taking care of myself? Oh, okay. <laughs> there you are. Oh, let me see if I... Oh, I hear you now. Okay. okay. Yes. Um, are you taking care of yourself? Yes. Um, I'm trying to take care of myself. I, uh, you know, talk a lot about radical self-care and um, you know, taking care of our mental health as well as our spiritual health and our physical health. And there are days when I feel like I'm doing that really well. And then there are days when I'm like, I could be better. Um, and, and then I try to act on those days when I feel like I'm in a funk. Um, so embracing vulnerability here, I don't take care of myself as well as I, I should, <laughs> um, as well as I talk about it. Um, but I'm definitely learning to do that just yesterday when I noticed that I was getting incredibly tired after mm -hmm. lots of uh, meetings, I went for a hike and that provided me with some sense of clarity and um, hopefully that'll last for the next week. And then I don't know what's going to happen after that, but one day at a time. Absolutely. One day at a time, right? So being a good planner, but also being flexible to changes. Right, making sure that you're taking care of yourself along the way and having a plan, but realizing that even the best plans go awry and just try to regroup after that and, you know, make the most out of it. I feel you. Um, tell us about your educational journey. So you're a doctor, uh, working on a doctorate in education, you know, as an educator, um, um, gone through um, you know graduate school and done a master's in education i'm very interested in hearing about a doctorate in education so tell us a little bit more about that yeah so great question again um i came to this country uh at the age of 10 from like many of us from the camps of kenya um, and didn't have any prior education when we came here i knew say this all the time to people, I knew a couple of curse words because the kids <laughs> in the camps were telling us like, you're going to America and therefore you're gonna need to learn a few things. And I remember when we arrived, me saying those things to my teacher, those couple words that I knew, and it turns out they were curse words and you're not supposed to say those. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, and so that really started at the age of 10. I've always been a lifelong learner and just curious about sort of what the world has to offer and what more I could gain. Mm -hmm. um, so, and also had just a lot of uh, adults in my life growing up who kind of helped us understand the importance of an education uh, and, you know, helped us think beyond our, uh, you know, specific circumstances and plan for the future. And so I think I took many of their advice to heart. I mm -hmm. went to Seattle University, which is a Jesuit uh, private university here in the state of Washington for both undergrad mm -hmm. and my master's. And then in 2017, visited Somalia for the first time since yeah, uh, yeah. Galpi, since 91 uh, with the goal, you know, with the ultimate goal of sort of like getting a job there and working in the field of education and then, um, you know, living there and, and doing education reform. I think that was my mm. path at the time. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, no, uh, there are better plans. Um, and while we're also doing our own planning, uh, so I came back uh, in 2017 and decided that perhaps, you know, living in Somalia or working in Somalia isn't the right thing for my family and I right now. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I decided to pursue a doctorate in education. Uh, it's a three-year doctorate program in the um, College of Education at Seattle University. The first year you learn about leader as self, you know, who are you? What mm -hmm. are your strengths? What are some of the areas of improvement? Uh, mm -hmm. reading a lot of literature on self-awareness and identity development. And then mm -hmm. in the second year, you're learning more about leaders and organizations and how to become an effective leader, mm -hmm. navigating the variety of different institutions that uh, many of us wow. want to lead in. And then the third year, you are working on your dissertation and also pivoting to leadership, uh, you know, as a global sort of lens. Um, so that's, that's amazing. Where, yeah, that's uh, the um, third year program. 
which I'm currently in right now, working on a dissertation looking at the lived experiences of African American and Black women in K-12 leadership positions mm -hmm. in King County, which is the county that I live in. Uh, and mm -hmm. inshallah, we'll graduate May of 2021. It's going to be a wonderful day and we're going to be celebrating along with you, you know, um, any success for me personally, the Somali woman is my personal success. Like, I just love that so much. So you let me know and we'll be there. You know, Shukriya, uh, sometimes what happens, um, you know, when I do these lives, I have some people in the comments and uh, uh, I feel like I don't know. And generation state of Washington and 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 our local government and school one PhD one and the and position one school social rahay or the Hawking County Council or Matagana Dorsha than London to Senate Kosovo so other like in and had one school social honey sidan that kid and the girl no and Matagana and his bar no a that could call it live with again are in Kenny and plant and so what not and Mark in Tasman Kosovo Kovia at is that enough Somali? Absolutely, absolutely. Wait, tell me why. One okay, have a bond. Adi will bond. Adi ga. You know, mamoin Somali jogo. Adi al Somali jogo. Ne arkan gawar. Adi go kala. Wah baran iso or mahali rahda had dawri. Hida hai yada kan kusomaliyat hai sadat kan ad behor yada kan kogo adi gihin. Maybe horan badu akhir sohan al qari. Adi ya ayi ga murkhar kodiyon. Dagal adi hadi or dagal hun mahaya dagal haga. Hariga haga li sadat hai dawri. Wan mar murkhar kod kujirna. Marketed can sell us the Dakan Koya, you know, he the Hawood, or what other Gihin, one Wafi and Mahuma. Eh, Shugri, back to English. How how do you balance being Somali and American? Yeah, I, uh, you know, I have so many thoughts about that question as somebody who's been uh, quite curious about belonging and feeling mm -hmm. like I've never uh, belong to a specific space and in particular in this country for a very long time uh, mm -hmm. but especially in the sort of you know political climate that many of us are sort of navigating I went back to our uh, birth country in 2017 like I mentioned and I think that was the only time in my adult life where I felt like I found somewhere where I was seen and invited and loved even though they made fun of us a couple times <laughs> because they were like why diaspora why diaspora um marke, i mean you know and that that experience i think was exactly what many of us you know sort of long for a space where we can bring our whole self into and not feel i mean ultimately we were judged but not feel like we were judged based on our racial identity or mm. you know, our background, right? And mm -hmm. you know, sometimes I feel like as a Somali American, especially you know, in the last four years where we're incredibly visible, often it feels like we're targeted because of our uh, multiple identities, being mm. both a Somali but also a Black Muslim, um, and the intersections of our complex identities. It mm -hmm. feels like we're sort of. Um, I mean, I don't want to say being watched, but sometimes it feels like that, right? And mm -hmm. ultimately what that does for me is push me to think harder about the kind of country that I hope to create, which is, uh, I think, different to the kind of country that we have right now, one that is incredibly divisive, 
Mm. Um, you know, there are, you know, folks that are allies and doing good work in community and trying to help us become a more just society. Mm -hmm. And I hope to sort of partner and create that more perfect union. Um, and I think one of the ways that we do that is by joining the political environment of our of our communities, right? And there's so many ways to lead. There are, you know, folks that are organizing and uh, activists mm -hmm. on the ground, and there's folks that are working within systems and trying to push the systems from the inside. And I think being on the other end, you know, coming up with policies that directly impact the communities that we come from mm -hmm. um, is one of the hopes that I have during this campaign. And ultimately, I feel like when we tackle the issues of white supremacy and racism from multiple angles that we're able mm -hmm. to get to uh, collective liberation because there are so many different strategies that we're employing uh, to create a more just union. Absolutely. Um, how do you tackle like these kind of conversations? Um, I, I'm not familiar, sorry about this, for not doing my homework as adequately as usual. The demographics of King County, I'm not familiar with that, but how do you broach these like um, conversations about racial justice and white supremacy um, in a way that doesn't, let's say, put off the majority, that welcomes them in more? Yeah. And is that something that's important to you especially in terms of, you know, being elect, wanting to be elected. Yeah, well, I think it's important to note how I came uh, into this understanding myself. You know, I mm -hmm. came to this country at the age of 10 and I realized right after 9-11 uh, that I was a young black Muslim um, at, at the intersection of both racism and Islamophobia. Um, and that mm -hmm. was when I was 15. And when I was 15, I, I think that was the most, probably the most transformational moment in my life where I learned about sort of who I am and how I'm perceived or how, mm -hmm. how I'm seen in this country. Um, and it also pushed me to look inward about sort of like, what are some of the things that I've learned about, you know, these people who look like me, like African-Americans in this country, um, and to learn about the historical context of this nation and to learn mm -hmm. about the enslavement of black people Mm -hmm. um, but not just the enslavement, but the, also the resistance of Black people and how they fought for mm -hmm. uh, not just the collective liberation for the, the Black diasporans, but for many other immigrants and refugees, right? And I think the civil rights movement um, led to our being here as Africans, you know? And so a lot of it was just like this internal self-reflection learning that I had to do on my own. Um, mm -hmm. And in terms of, you know, your question about the demographics of King County, like I am incredibly grateful to live in a county that is diverse, mm -hmm. that um, I'm sure like many parts of this country has challenges, but that is actively trying to get to a more perfect union um, mm -hmm. through policy, through pushing initiatives like um, supporting black women who run for office, mm -hmm. um, through organizing. There are many young people, black and brown indigenous folks who are on the front lines, you know, um, doing the incredible work of pushing these systems to um, reinvest in community and not the oppressive systems that hold us back. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, this is a, a great county that's, you know, trying to do the work. And are we there yet? I don't think so. <laughs> but I think there's a lot of momentum now to elect people who look like the uh, communities that they live in. Um, mm -hmm. to ultimately bring policy with not just an intellectual understanding of it, but from a lived experience lens and from helping uh, countless families navigate those same systems themselves. And that's mm -hmm. actually one of the things that I bring is that like I grew up in public housing. I know many families in this district struggle to find adequate housing. Mm -hmm. I navigated the school system in this uh, county. I know and have helped with many families navigating it with their young children when I worked for a, our local school district. And um, I know, you know, the children and families and some of the challenges that they face there because I work on an initiative that is supporting children and families prenatal up until the age of 24. Um, and while, you know, these systems seem sort of siloed and they do their own thing, they're mm. actually not. They are incredibly interconnected um, and they intersect in so many ways. And when they do intersect, they have a disproportionate impact on communities of color uh, mm -hmm. especially here in King County, and I'm sure nationwide as well. You know, what happens when our legal system interacts with our uh, policing system, with healthcare, mm -hmm. with education and the school to prison pipeline, like they all sort of connect. And then that connection is what I'm hoping to bring a systems level lens to.
Inshallah. Absolutely. And I really like that you um, approach it in that matter um, and understanding that it, a lot of the inequalities in our society are due to the systems in place that um, if we're not actively fighting against that, actively dismantling these systems that are set up, then we're not really making an impact. And um, these uncomfortable but necessary conversations just have to be had um, that we're really not well until all of us are well, right? That any injustice anywhere is injustice everywhere. And just really getting to that point of having people understand that. Um, I believe personally that it's important that people care about other people, but also the people who don't have that philosophy, the fact of the matter is we're interconnected and interdependent, right? Yeah. My neighbor's issues, uh, you know, housing issues, healthcare issues, they affect me. Right. So there's also that lens as well. So approaching the problem from multiple angles, I think that's um, very, very important. Absolutely. Um, you spoke a little bit about how you connect with the community and do some, um, you know, community work, especially with the youth. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I mentioned being in community for 14 years now and I look younger than I actually am. Um, but I also started young <laughs> one time for that Somali gene. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, I started, you know, at the age of 19 and um, really just I, like I knew I was one of those young people who sort of knew their path and mm. I think have always been a planner. And like, you know, I would say if I did this thing, it would probably lead to this thing. Sometimes it didn't work great right? because ultimately That's good. Uh, there are some plans that are outside of our control. But um, mm. I tried to sort of align the things that I was doing with the things that I hope to do um, and working with young people and families and children uh, has been, I think, my life sort of lifelong purpose. Right. And mm -hmm. I happen to be in this role now as the youth development strategy lead supporting 31 organizations who are working with young people in like four mm -hmm. different buckets. So some of the organizations are providing mentoring. Some of the organizations are building young people's positive racial identity. Mm -hmm. um, some of the organizations are working with uh, young people in you know, building a healthy relationship with their peers. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you know, the others are working on cultivating leadership for young people so that they could have a pipeline to run for office, which is one of my platforms. Like how do we mm -hmm. empower youth? We create a pipeline for them to step into those roles so that mm -hmm. when I'm, you know, done in four years, uh, you know, we've created a new generation of young people who step up and lead us into Absolutely. the future. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, working with young people has been um, incredibly humbling experience. Wallahi, as an adult, mm -hmm. like I, I see them navigating spaces much more differently than I have as a yeah. young person. They mm -hmm. are so aware of their identity and what they bring to spaces and their bullshit detector is incredibly <laughs> high. Like, I don't know like where that comes from, if that's like innate or if that's something that's learned over time, but yeah. they, they know when someone is being real and intentional and authentic mm -hmm. in how they present themselves and mm -hmm. um, they're able to call people in uh, to their better selves. And so mm -hmm. just being in spaces with them, you know, I mentioned, you know, this afternoon, we're talking to young people about uh, this new project called Project Why I Vote Young uh, Folks of Color in particular, and getting them to um, tell us their stories about what this election means to them, what's that yes. for them. And every time I'm like in a space with them, I just, I'm like, this is too much brilliance. Like I cannot, like my, I get emotional just thinking about it. Wallahi. I love that, especially because it's such a, um, we're looking at um, when we talk about voting, especially, you know, people have um, time and again been disappointed. And uh, sometimes people stop buying into the system, stop believing that their vote makes a difference. Um, so I'm really glad, you know, that you're doing this project of, of why I vote. But since this is a huge issue, you know, um, what else are you working on to encourage, you know, people to still believe in this, to still know and see their power? Yeah, I think, you know, what um, one of the quotes that I think about is like the an Audre Lorde quote about um, undoing the systems of white supremacy requires having new tools. And I think mm. this is a great opportunity to start thinking about what those new tools are. And right. uh, I think young people are should be at the forefront of that. Help us 
to reimagine what it looks like to galvanize community to mm -hmm. not only vote, but to stay in the democratic process? Like, what does it look like to have a campaign that centers young people, communities of color throughout the campaign, but also is invited into the rooms where we're talking mm -hmm. about the county's budget, or we're talking about policing, or we're talking about education investment? Like, mm -hmm. what does it look like to actually bring those who've been on the sidelines, you know, marginalized for centuries into those spaces? And that's mm -hmm. one of the things that I hope to do. And, um, you know, I hear you on your point about not feeling like this is um, worth it, or right. you know, that your vote is going to do anything. Um, mm -hmm. But it's the only tool that we have in addition to right. other tools, right? There are mm -hmm. many tools, but I feel like it's the most effective tool um, to exercise your rights, right? This is mm -hmm. a right that many people have fought for and died for. Um, Absolutely. And that connection for people, I think mm -hmm. it's incredibly important. And especially for our communities who um, don't have that lived experience of voting in their birth country or deciding mm -hmm. who their leaders are. You can actually give them the perspective of like, well, what if there was someone who looked like you who came to you, you know, and I think actually that's part of the challenge, right? Like, why would you vote for someone who doesn't understand your needs or mm -hmm. the experience that you navigate in this country who doesn't have that heart centered sort of um, approach? Like, mm -hmm. why would you vote? Right. And so that's right. part of the reason why I'm on things like Opportunity Pack that is supporting Black women and running for office because mm -hmm. I really believe in representation and not just talking Absolutely. about it, but being it. And I think that is going to galvanize young people. Like young folks are excited about our campaign because they see a Somali woman who grew up in public housing just like them. Yeah. That's we're meeting this afternoon who was able to dream and take that risk. You know, and what yeah. does that do to a young person's heart when they see that, like that they too. That's amazing. Position themselves in that way. And I, I believe it allows them to also dream and believe in themselves, right? And also allow them to see that this is where they belong and this is their country now, which sometimes um, it's difficult for immigrants to really settle in into the country and say like, this is home now. Um, sometimes I feel like we still have one foot out and one foot in, but our young people who are growing, who are born and bred and like growing up in this country, it's even more difficult for them to have a foot out because it's like, okay, where is that other place? I, I don't even know that place, you know? Imagine somebody who's like born and bred in the United States or anywhere outside of Somalia, what do they know about Somalia, right? So they have to make this situation work. Um, I talk a lot about like the Somali identity and identity development and the grief that comes along with um, letting go <laughs> of uh, um, the old country, right? So you're running for office here and you said momentarily earlier that you had dreams of working in Somalia as well. Um, how do you balance, you know, again, like with the two worlds, do you have um, dreams still of working home? Do you connect with people there and like, you know, um, pursue work or opportunities in terms of uplifting, I guess, the Somali in like, not outside of Somalia, but within Somalia? Yeah. Mashallah, you're actually incredibly good at this stuff. Um, <laughs> like a natural interviewer. So give a shout out to Ifra for this. Uh, thank question. you, thank you. I appreciate yeah, you're that. Welcome. Um, you're like, of course. I mean, I've been doing this for how long now? But, you know, <laughs> I, um, I, you know, what you said about kind of one foot in and one foot out of this country sort of resonates, right? Because I think when we abrupt, abruptly had to leave our country mm. uh, with like, you know, nothing but maybe a bag, literally a bag and our loved ones. And if that, right? To the, to the refugee camps and then being dropped, airdropped in the middle of nowhere in the States or in some part of, uh, of the West. Mm. Uh, many of us came with this idea that like, we're going to just rebuild and, you know, get some money and then move back and, mm -hmm. you know, live the life that I think we were used to. And, and, and then you know, time went on. Yeah, constant, and then time went on. Like we've been here some 22 years. Like my family and I have been here 22 years now, and um, that is an incredibly long time. And many of us, I think, now are beginning to realize that this is our home, right? Mm -hmm. That this mm -hmm. too is our country, and that um, we have a responsibility to do the work here, right? That mm -hmm. there isn't just injustice in Somalia; it's also mm -hmm. here. It's everywhere, right? And so. Mm -hmm. 
uh, for many of us who are in public service, have been in public service, we understand that, you know, people still have needs here and mm -hmm. have a responsibility to try to make an impact. And so that right now, my focus is running for <laughs> office here and, you know, elevating, amplifying the voices of people in District 5. And mm -hmm. God knows what the future holds. I think my long term goal, you know, pr probably close to retirement is <laughs> to get a you know, beach house in uh, Jazeera Beach in Mugudu <laughs> and sip some Somali share with some Nutella. Like, right. that's my long term goal. Girl, the kind of like, um, you know, landscape that Somalia has and, you know, the the beautiful, beautiful landscape, right? Um, absolutely. Tasa no balana, that's the goal, you know, a, a beach house and what sheikh, Mr. Kismayo, you know, Tasa no balana. Um, you know, politics aside, who is Shukri Olo outside of that? Yeah, because we talked about motherhood. We talked about the education aspect. We talked about the campaign, right? Who else yeah. is in there? You are trying to bring out sort of my whole identity, um, <laughs> my my whole sense of being, right into this conversation. Whatever right? you're comfortable with, yeah. right? We're multidimensional, right? Whatever you're comfortable with. We are multifaceted human beings, and I think to expect that, like, we are one thing and that's it. Um, mm -hmm. obviously is not realistic. I think um, I, I'm just a believer in people and all people that are good. I'm a believer in, you know, human beings and our ability to rise to the occasion and mm -hmm. um, to do good. And I'm a believer in being better, right? I, I think there are many of us that are trying to create a more better, um, a more perfect union, whatever mm -hmm. that looks like in our local communities. And I, right. I hope to be part of that change. You know, one of my mentors, though, talks about, you know, some um, 50 years ago, right? She says there there were people who were on the sidelines, you know, during the civil rights movement. There were people who were bystanders. There were mm. people who were on the side of injustice. And there were people who put their bodies on the line mm -hmm. uh, for, uh, for humanity, right? And I hope to be mm -hmm. one of those people. I hope to be one of those people that, like, 100 years from now, folks would read back on and say, you know, Ifrah did something about this uh, incredibly hard year that we've had. Like, Ifrah showed up in this way, Shuki yeah. showed up in this way uh, to contribute to, you know, a more just uh, uh, community. Mm -hmm. And it, that, that, I think, would be my ultimate goal, to leave a legacy that is beyond uh, our time, that lasts yeah. beyond our time. That's beautiful. And, you know, I definitely see that, you know, the, all the things that you're trying to do, it, it is um, absolutely a lofty goal. It is something I absolutely believe in, um, not to be a bystander, not in your own life, not in your own community. Uh, you are where you are, where you're supposed to be for a reason. Right. So you make the most out of it and you try to contribute using all of the gifts and the talents that you have now and try to learn more of how you can contribute. So kudos to you and I applaud you. And I'm just really glad to um, talk with you about that today. Another thing, I, just a thought just came up to my mind, you know, cause I'm teaching online right now. And I'm like, how are the babies doing virtual learning? How are the babies doing virtual learning? Yeah, how are you like coping with that? How am I doing? How are the parents <laughs> doing? Um, no. <laughs> I think, you know, the babies are going to be all right. Honestly, I think they're going to be just fine. Uh, you know, are there, you know, day-to-day -day struggles about, you know, the internet going in and out or that assignment that they forgot to do or, you know, taking a break every 10 minutes? Like, mm -hmm. that happens. It's part of, um, I guess, the, you know, the kind of climate that we're all living in, right? Uncertainty. There's just a lot going on in our little minds. Mm -hmm. um, I think the babies are okay. I think as parents, though, we might be uh, stressing or, you know, anxious about sort of their learning. And I've been leaning in and saying to myself that just do the best that you can, right? Literally just do the best that you can and all mm -hmm. will be fine. And mm -hmm. the more we are relaxed, the more mm -hmm. we are together in our feelings, the more we process whatever anxiety or um, just fear that we have about what's going on in the moment. And there's, a lot of, there's COVID, there's, uh, you know, the racial reckoning that's happening in this country. Our region mm -hmm. uh, was on fire just uh, uh, 
couple weeks ago, um, still is. So we were in like a smoke um, environment for several, like maybe over a week. And yeah. uh, there's just a lot happening. And then, you know, people are losing their jobs. Uh, people might be losing their homes. So there's just a lot of real fears that people are experiencing. And then mm -hmm. there's the online learning, right? Um, and <laughs> people have lost loved ones. And then there's the online learning. And so yeah, I, I yeah. find myself that in the bigger scheme of things, right. 20 years from now, our kids are not going to remember that Zoom meeting that they were disconnected from. <laughs> they will remember their parents helping them talk through their emotions and their feelings mm -hmm. um, and noticing their own parents doing that too. Sometimes I'll be in a moment and then I'll say, oh, guys, I'm sorry. I noticed that I did that earlier. I apologize. Um, I had a moment and forgive me, right? I hope they yes. remember that and not, you know, the their mom freaking out about, you know, them not doing their assignments, which happens sometimes. Absolutely. It happens to me at home. You know, I'm a teacher and I am a parent and I'm like, what is this assignment <laughs> that's missing here? What is this? Fifth and then I have to remind myself to. Yeah. What's that? Fifth grade math is the enemy. I don't know <laughs> where that comes from. Oh, no. We have lost Shuri temporarily. Oh, am I back? I hear you. Yeah. I don't see you. Oh, there. Okay. Man, it's just an icon. I still don't see you. Yeah, I don't know what happened to the camera. Um, okay. As long as we can hear you, I guess that's great, right? <laughs> In this time and age, you know, sometimes with the Zoom calls as well, right. um, when I'm teaching online, sometimes, you know, things happen. So, all right. So, again, again, we have wonderful questions, right? And towards the end, I would like to, you know, uh, give opportunity for the audience to ask questions. So, if you have any questions... Um, for Shugri, if you have any questions, please ask, please write in the comments. Um, you can write them in Somali. If you want to write it in English, that's okay too. Um, it comes part of being uh, Somali and American that we are going to you know, try to balance both of them. Somebody asked, uh, who are you sending this message to, Americans or Somali? Well, when you're a Somali American, you really um, are sending the message to both, right? Um, you, embody, you embody both at this point in the game. So it is what it is. We can't discard either one of those identities. So it's just, you know, that's just the, uh, oh, there's, I Wonderful. Know, I, don't, I don't know what happened. Um, well, I'm so that glad that you're back. Was that question directed at me, or I, I'm, I, 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 I think for both of us, I guess. Who are you sending this message to, American or Somali? Shukri, take it away. Who are you speaking, you know, to? <laughs> yeah, Lisa. Uh, yeah, I, I'm talking to both um, because I have yes. to be both, right? I'm a Somali American. Uh, and so I hope that that audience is able to understand the message that we're offering today. Absolutely. I speak both Somali and English uh, because I also embody both of those identities. They're both important to me. However, there is something to make a note of here that a lot of us do primarily speak English because that is just a language lingua franca of everything else that we do right so i came over the weekend to my aunt's home to my aunt i'm only speaking 100 percent somali right but i'm speaking to my cousin and my other cousins we're speaking english are we not somali okay. still yeah we are but we primarily communicate in english um with one another and it, and it's it is uh what comes with you know that immigrant uh narrative or that immigrant journey all right. So how is the Somali community reacting to your candidacy? It's a question from Naima Mohammed. Naima Mohammed, how is the Somali community reacting to your candidacy? Great question, Naima. And, you know, I think um, so this is a conversation that I've been having with Somalis and um, allies as well in the district since November about my candidacy. And so there's just been overwhelming support about, you know, this potential of a Somali, a black Muslim, a mother, 
uh, who's done community work for this number of years, you know, elevating um, the issues that matter to people of this district. And so I would say that there's a lot of support within the community, but also broadly, right? Uh, we are in a district that uh, our people live in, but also there's a lot of other folks, other communities of color, other allies, voters, uh, who happen to be non-Somali, who also understand the issues that we care about and uh, live through the issues that we care about and have the same needs as any other population in this district. And so, um, so far, the uh, support has been incredible. Um, one of the reasons why we announced early uh, the election is August of next year, uh, the primary is anyway. Um, but one of the reasons why we announced early is so that we can co-create a platform with community so that we can amplify um, some of the issues that they care about so that we could help them understand the democratic process and what is a county council position and what do they do. And many folks turns out even um, within, you know, the broader King County community don't even know what a county council member does or what mm -hmm. their role are or how much power and-, and Well, tell us, tell us about them. What do yeah. they do? Yeah. So county council members represent a specific district. Um, they elevate the issues of their district. They fight for the people of their district. Um, ultimately, while keeping in mind that there are other districts and other human beings who have similar needs. Um, and so my, my goal would be to help our community understand that um, and to also you know, show them that they need to be part of that process, right? And this is what it looks like when you have you know, residents that are um, inspired and are ready for change and are not just ready for one person to be at the seat of the table, but to have their entire community join them. And sometimes maybe even remove that table and create a circle, you know, a circle of belonging where they feel like they finally have a space to, to voice uh, their truth and their challenges. Um, so back to your question, I think the Somali community has received this really well. Um, and broadly as well, there are other folks who are excited about our candidacy, my candidacy. Absolutely. Thank you very much for that. And I think that's a great question. You know, um, it still speaks to our, you know, immigrant narrative or our uh, journey here in the country where we, like you said, suddenly leave our homeland because of the, um, you know, the dysfunction and instability that is happening. Um, and then we find ourselves in another place trying to make it and then time goes on and, you know, we feel uh, a little bit more stable. And I talked a little bit about like kind of early today in my journey in life and in terms of stability, once you're in that little bit stable position, you're like, how can I reach back and help somebody else out? What can I do for the community that I live in now? And how can I contribute to that community now? So I think it's a, it's a great deal. And it's also um, that representation. Um, you can't be what you can't see, you know, that young people are looking at you now and saying, well, this is, you know, this is my community. Uh, somebody else like me is also, you know, campaigning and wanting to leave this community. I can also do this. So I see this, you know, as a win, to be honest, on so many levels, Shugri, that you uh, represent, you know, uh, women leadership, uh, Somali women leadership, um, immigrant leadership, um, you know, this new American identity and, you know, taking um, charge and making sure that you're contributing to the community that you are now a part of. And then just, you know, the young people are looking at you no matter their ethnicity, no matter their background that, wow, you know, look at her. She can, you know, do this. I can do this too. And so it's a great inspiration. I, I really like seeing that. Yeah, that, that was really beautiful, Ibrah. That's exactly it. You can't be what you can't see. Um, and often, you know, in our uh, really liberal spaces, there is a desire uh, to have representation, right? And there's so many beautiful, you know, brochures and online uh, formats where people are talking about the need for representation and how important it is. And then when we mm -hmm. put ourselves out there and, and we're saying, we're not just talking about representation, we're being representation that I think yeah. there are some people who are taken aback by that. Like, wait, what, what, um, what's <laughs> happening? Like, why would you challenge this? Or I don't mean for real. Way? Yeah, <laughs> not in this way. Like we need representation, but not in this not way. Not yet, it's not your um, turn not yet. Not yet, Take, wait your turn, right? And so I've always just been someone who follows her heart and um, God's plan for my life. And 
um, going with it. And uh, and I think the the support from our community and beyond has been one of those anchors um, to to my decision. Right? Uh, if I didn't have that, then I wouldn't have thought about this idea uh, almost a year ago next month. Absolutely, that's amazing. Um, there's a question on here that I, um, you know, wondered about. Um, how how we best answer the question? And are are this or is this in fact an issue um, that exists currently? So Muna said, Muna Salat said, we need to have Somali the Hafsiya the Kutira Kahadal Yasid Allah Awin Laha. So I'm not sure really from from what I know um, of where you are what that situation looks like. So maybe you could tell us, uh, in a broad term, there are more African-American males in the United States judicial, like, you know, car, uh, carceral system. And I imagine that black immigrant Muslim boys are not too far um, outside of that, you know, of that definition of black male incarceration rate, you know? So can you speak on that a little bit? Sure. Um, the connection was a little off, but I hope you are able to hear me, Hadda. Um, I am, yeah. Okay, good. Uh, so, it was like a little, like, like, yeah, there's like, um, I don't know if that's my my side or. Um, I will put myself happening. on mute while you're speaking so we can see. Hold on, let me. All right, so we're figure out some technical issues. We will be right back, right back, trying to figure out some technical issues. Hopefully, Shukri will be able to join us again. All right, so while we're waiting, how's everyone doing this wonderful Sunday? Well, for me, it's afternoon, Sunday afternoon. It's about 3.46 p.m. Um, I'm in another state, but it's still Eastern time zone. I will be going home soon. My background looks a little bit different, right? I had on, I don't have my yeah. beautiful um, wallpaper. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yay, Shuri, you're back. <laughs> All right. I'll, when you're speaking, I'll put myself on mute then. I so that, that like the audio is better. Yeah. 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 Okay. Sounds good. So I think I, I caught the question, something about what are we going to do about young people who are in our prison system? Uh, yes. Or jail system. Um, <clears throat> sure. So I think that's uh, an important question and one that I think about a lot as someone with two young children, um, a black boy in particular, and as someone who's worked in our school system and uh, has been able to understand you know, racism and white supremacy and what that does to our communities in particular and African-American black diaspora community. I think one of the challenges is that, you know, when we came here some 25, I would say 25, the majority of us 25 years ago, many of us didn't really understand the historical context of the nations that we were being brought in, right? And we um, were told about the money growing from the trees and you know, that the, the America was the land of opportunity and you could make something of yourself and, you know, that everything was just wonderful here, right? And um, for some communities, in particular, you know, those who are uh, and have proximity to whiteness, that might be the case. But for those immigrants and refugees who happen to be Black or have uh, proximity to Blackness, um, that has not been the case. And the data also reflects that. I think, you know, one of the things that is important is to understand um, the context of this country and how uh, white supremacy as a system has impacted uh, Black people, has not only enslaved Black people, but the policies that um, were put in place to continue to oppress Black people, um, to um, policies in the education system or um, in housing and in redlining and some of the oppressive ways and Jim Crow laws and some of the oppressive ways that um, you know, legislators in this country have continued to um, keep intact the system of white supremacy. And so because we are also Black, um, our experience might be different because we immigrated to this country, but because we're also Black, we are seen as um, African Americans, right? And the data shows that where you have a large number of Somali children, when I worked in the school district, who uh, are missing school, um, who are being disciplined in school, 
um, who are going straight from the schools to the prison. You know, they call that the school to prison pipeline. Um, and we're seeing a lot of our young people also caught up in the system. Um, many of them, you know, you talked about uh, racial identity and um, the sense of identity and how important it is to young person. And many of them are trying to figure out who they are. And at the same time, you know, are they Muslim? Are they Somali? Are they black? Um, are they American? You know, are they, you know, another identity uh, that they might want to explore? Like, who are they? And I think those are like great, like important questions, right? Like many of us have gone through that. Um, and sometimes, you know, what happens for those of us who had those questions, we happen to have positive adults in our life who are able to help sort of ground us in our identities. And some of our kids are lacking that. And we know that there's a lot of research on positive identity development and what happens when a young person is uh, connected to one adult who's able to change their trajectory. Um, and more of our young people need that connection. They need um, positive adults in their life. They need the system also to change, right? Like no matter how good a child is, if you're up against a system that sees you in a particular light, then I think it's hard to try to figure out a way to maneuver around it. You know, certainly there have been those of us who've been able to maneuver around it, but probably due to the grace of God or, you know, someone who's helped us, um, that was certainly not on our own and maybe our will, but certainly not only because of our will, right? And more young people need access to programs, more young people need adults in their life who are able to connect them to resources. Um, and we need to be able to tackle the issue at the systemic level, you know, get to the root of the system that continues to hold our young children in this position of oppression. Um, thank you so much, Shugri, for so eloquently and detailed, you know, explaining that. Um, I understand that, you know, and a lot of people who are, I would say, educated in this country will understand that. Um, not to say that, you know, people who aren't formally educated won't understand this, but these kind of like specific systemic inequalities are really difficult for a lot of immigrants to understand because there is this narrative of what America represents that is first like sold to us before we even get here, right? That is sold to people, you know, right now outside of America, what America represents and how when you're here, depending on your proximity to whiteness, how you'll fare. Um, how do we get that back to, you know, our communities that you and I are from? Uh, deeply in, in I feel that, you know what I mean? Like, you're more likely in a lukulunted poverty or you're likely to not receive good health care. Uh, you're more likely to be incarcerated. So, and a award that's not a good person, it's not a good person, it's not a good person. So then, like, oh, my, 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 the only way I'm going to do this is that I'm going to do this. I'm and there's some gabdo hata or awanad ubahan or ubahan qof lahadlo or we diyo mtukana mhaan ka awiya iyo maante ta mhaad dhiri meisa, right? Warid ba nahi wan fami karna. Like in wilishina, I think wa, um, wa ina fahan no wadda kaane ta system ku yahay isudu u shakayo wa afar bukol sano dad lugu meisani yi o anna kano e. Marke anna ka marka wadda kaane maane labaatan ishaan kohor I don't know. I think in English, like in Anakamano Shagin. And let's say I'm going to go to the next one. 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 I'm going to go to the
Marke mm. and my Nina and Adanki and Lokorne, I'm a teacher ski, I'm a doctor, a position of power, Kuchiran Hanurahan, Mudo Mithiro, Hatin Somali Batin, immigrant Batin, Kan Batin, that kind of or Nick Mithi, Matihin, right? You're not, you're not those people. Mm. I don't know in Ahishi, if uh, Rahi, um, mm -hmm. that, that sort of message, like in Anakua Henley. And I did, I did. It's like they you have your different kind of black. Yeah, you're different. Yeah, you know, you're, you're and different meaning like you're better than, right? Ultimately, that that's what they were basically. Absolutely. Don't I couldn't have said it better. I really appreciate you saying that. Um, it's a barrier, you know, this app culture, it's a barrier to problem solving, right? And there are real problems. There are bigger problems than app you right? So where we're talking about kids, you know, involving themselves in, you know, very dangerous situations, drug and alcohol abuse and gangs and, you know, other, you know, things that are just really detrimental to their lives. The last thing we should be thinking about is app. But then again, the way our culture is, no matter where we are in the world, impacts our lives directly. We're, we don't live in a vacuum, you know, and I talk about this a lot. 
you guys, this is my this is my stuff, you know, this is my forte. I talk a lot about how culture influences people's behavior because that's real, that's real. We don't live in a vacuum. Marka, Marka and Haisana, real problems and we're worried about what people might think, it prevents us from solving this real problem that has a detrimental, like material effect on our life. You know, material yeah. effect on our children's life. Marka. Uh, thank you for, you know, in uh, Somali, um, it's an ongoing conversation. Inshallah, in the future, I wish to invite you again uh, to talk about this in detail and how we can overcome these barriers that are really detrimental. It's not bad, you know. We're not specific to, we're not like unique in that regard. All people in the world love their individual cultures and love to hold on to what makes them them. But we do need to be able to recognize the, the things, the cultural norms that are preventing or that are physical barriers um, and allowing us not to, you know, problem solve, not to, that are in the way of us finding solutions. We need to be able to see that and say, this actually is kind of wrong and we need to we need to move past this. And it takes time and change it is just time. so painfully slow. Yeah, sure. like I think people might be wondering like why talk about culture as a political candidate. Um, it, it, I talk about it because I am of your culture, right? I understand right. that. So if we're working at the systems level and coming up with policy agendas and we're coming up with programs that support young people, but mm -hmm. then at the cultural level, our families don't want to access those services because they're so afraid of what so-and-so is going to think about them, mm -hmm. then there's a disconnect, right? And so there is. like, how do we hold both at the same time? Like, how do we build a more just system that better supports our young people? And how mm -hmm. do we also address the cultural barriers that prevents our families from navigating mm -hmm. and accessing the resources we're trying to create. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, like, how do you do both at the same time? You know, like, I don't know what the right answer is, but I'm uh, open to exploring that. Absolutely. And thank you for working on that. I definitely appreciate that. And I appreciate that that is a challenge and that is a real thing. We can't discount cultural norms. We can't not have them in the equation when we're problem solving. Right, so we talk about this a lot, like in education and in medicine, what are the norms? What are the cultural norms that are standing in the way of this um, being applied? You know, what are the cultural norms that are standing in the way of this reality being reached? So it's an, it's very important. We have to talk about it in order, and we have to apply it to our policies or whatever legislation that is made, because ultimately these legislations are affecting real people. Right. So if they're affecting real people. If the real people don't buy into it, they're just, uh, you know, just empty. You know, they don't make an impact then. Right. So. Yeah. Okay, we've been at this for like an hour now. You know, one last question. I saw that Harira Naima said, um, and I really like this. Just finalize this, wrap this up. So basically, what are you, what issues are you gonna be working on the most um, when you are elected? Inshallah, and I love the when. And what I'll hang shakendona said the area, midwhawe then I wah but a shada, midwhawe down kuriha, mid the said had. Oh no, we have a lot. Oh, sugar. There she is. Okay. We got to work with technology. You know, it makes our lives good, but at the same time, sometimes it doesn't work the way we want it to. Hey, yeah, sugar. I'm just getting calls. So every time I get a call, I have to quickly <laughs> decline and then um, yes. come back to the like screen. A, you're, a hot, you're in hot demand, Hades. I hate it. We won't take too much of your time. I apologize. Um, no, okay. you're fine. Okay. 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 I think uh, and teen area then it um how we to have that slide is not and platform that then slide is not and then information can take us all on this no a platform that is co-created with community co-created with community right because that's who you're working for that is yeah so we're not uh, so you're not up here like saying you you you're doing everything wrong and I got the solutions no this is a partnership that is a right? partnership. 
it's partnership. And I really like that. And I appreciate you so much, Shubri. Um, thank you, Abaya, for taking your time today. Um, and I'd mellow with acted, you know, your thoughts, your journey, your um, you know, policies and the platforms that you're running on. Whatever you need from us on our side, let us know. And we are here to support you. Um, whatever last words that you want to share with the audience, please go ahead. And then we're gonna um gonna finish up for today. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much, Makoda Fak, for the uh, the space to just get to know you a bit more and to be in conversation. Apologies for the tech stuff. You know, this is a live stream. I um I can count how many times I've done live stream, <laughs> probably like three times now. Um, so it's a learning and progress and walaliyal. And at the end of the day, you know, so du'aya. Uh, that's actually the only thing I can ask of you right now is that you make du'a that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes this easy for me. Absolutely. And I mean, I mean, I mean, that, I mean. Um, is working on this if it's qair, right? Absolutely. If it's qair, if it's something that will uh, help us get to a more just uh, community. Um, and, you know, we'll be, we'll be in touch. I think this is a fluid conversation and then um, who knows what the future holds, but I, I thank you for giving me the, the time and the space to just chat with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Abaya. Thank you, everybody who's here, who's given us their time. Time is obviously the most valuable resource that we have. It's the most beautiful gift that you can give anybody. And I appreciate that you spent your time with us.